Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Overruled with me, Katie Zed. And today I have with me Justin Coleman, who I'm sure you guys recognize because you're all very big fans of mine and you've been here twice before. Now, this is your third appearance. So nice to have you. Hey. Nice to have me back. <laughs> yeah. So this is actually the case that we're going to cover today. You brought to my attention because you were actually in prison with the gentleman that we're going to talk about. Both of the gentlemen that we're going to talk about, actually. Um, so I guess what we're going to do is I'm going to get into the story because obviously, you know, the second half of the story and I've researched the first half of the story. So I guess we'll just get started. Hello to everyone in the chat. So far, I see Phil and Hazel, and I'm sure other people will be filing in soon um, or watching after the fact. Don't forget, you could always catch us um, and the replays on rumble.com slash KDZ. Okay, so this episode is about Clarence Elkins. And Clarence is from Barberton, Ohio. And on June 6th, 1998, 1998, Come on, Katie, you can talk today, right? <laughs> June 6, 1998. There was a woman named Judith Johnson who happened to be Clarence Elkins' mother-in-law, and she was having a sleepover with her granddaughter, Brooke, who was six years old at the time. And feel free if you want to comment or jump in, Justin, anytime. Just start talking yeah. and I'll shut up for a minute. <laughs> I actually never researched his life before or anything like that. So yeah. a lot of this I'm going to be actually learning from you. Yeah, because you know, it's one of those. I know all the inside stuff, and, yeah. and you know, we kept, you know, obviously, we were interested in everything that happened afterwards, mm -hmm. but it led up to that. That's you're going to be teaching. Yeah, I'm glad because this is, I like doing episodes like this. When I did the, there's a couple of episodes that I did with my friends from Hawkhound Media, like the Cocaine Bear episode or the one about that Tetris murder where they didn't know the story and I got to tell them the story and get their actual reaction. So this is kind of like, mm -hmm. I like to do it this way. So this is good. <laughs> um, okay, so sleepover time at grandma's house. Brooke, who is Judith's granddaughter, is sleeping over. And Brooke is also Clarence's niece through his it's his wife's niece so i mean i don't know how you all feel about it but i like my husband's nieces and nephews i they're my nieces and nephews too now you know so um so sometime in the early morning of the next day so it'd be june 7th between 2 30 and 5 30 a.m a man broke breaks into judith's judith's house and bludgeons her so brutally that the investigators, when they first arrived at the scene, they thought that she had been like stabbed to death. That's how much blood was at the scene, which is kind of crazy. Usually you would think, although this was a small town, so they probably didn't get a lot of murders, but you would think that the cops would be able to tell the difference between a bludgeoning and a stabbing. But now that I'm thinking about it in real time, probably not. They probably haven't seen very many murders in Arberton, Ohio, right? Well, I mean, the first might be free and stuff like that, but everything after that splatters. So I could see where somebody would make uh, that mistake if they're not looking at an actual, they're looking at the mess rather than at wounds. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, so in the middle of the night, Brooke was uh, woken up by the commotion in the living room. Uh, Judith was sleeping on the couch in the living room. Brooke was up in the bedroom. And um, so she's woken up and she comes down the stairs to see what's happening. And she sees her grandmother like lying in a pool of blood on the living room floor. And as a six-year-old, she does what six-year-olds do. And she runs back upstairs to the bed and hides under the covers. Unfortunately, the guy was still in the house and finds her and beats her until she passes out and then rapes her, the six-year-old. It's horrible. And... A lot of the other documentaries and stuff that I've um, seen about this case, they say, oh, well, she was sexually assaulted, this and that. No, he raped her. Like, that's the word that we're going to use for it because that's what happened to this poor child. Luckily, um, from her own words, is she does not remember that part of it because she was knocked out at the time. Um, obviously, she remembers the trauma of seeing her grandmother and her being beaten as well. But that part of it, she doesn't remember to this day. So that's on the bright side, I guess. Um, so 7 a.m. the next morning, Brooke wakes up 
realized that it wasn't a bad dream and she calls a close family friend, but the friend doesn't answer the phone. Unfortunately, it goes to voicemail. And this is back in the days where it was probably like an actual answering machine with a tape and all that. I'm going to play that for you guys now. I have the audio from that. So this is Ooh. Brooke at six years old calling a friend, a uh, friend of the family, to try to get help. She's in this house alone with her bludgeoned to death grandmother. Hi, I'm not here right now. Just leave a message and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Bye. I'm sorry to hear all you said, but my grandma died and I need somebody to get my mom for me. I'm all alone. Somebody get home my grandma. Now please, would you get home with me as soon as you can? Bye. Okay, so if that does not bring chills to the back of your neck and your arms, I don't know what's wrong with you. But I have listened to that several times in the last couple of weeks, and it kind of chokes me up every time I hear it. Um, I'm just picturing this child looking for help. Uh, so Brooke doesn't know what else to do, so she goes next door. Some of the research that it did, did said it was two doors down, so it was either next door or two doors down. And she knocks on the door. And a woman answers named Tanya Brazel. This woman answers the door, sees Brooke in her nightgown covered in blood, the whole nine, opens the door. Tanya's like, what's going on? Brooke says, I need help, you know. Tanya has this girl wait on her front porch for almost 45 minutes, just standing on her front porch, um, which is kind of crazy. Then she comes back out and um, ends up driving Brooke to her mom's house. And on the way to her mom's house, Tanya asks Brooke, like, what's, you know, Brooke's telling her what happened. And one of the things that Brooke, the six-year-old at the time, says to Tanya Brazel was that the man who attacked them looked like her Uncle Clarence. She didn't say it was her Uncle Clarence. He said the guy looked like my... Uncle Clarence. Uh, so this insane game of telephone starts where Tanya tells Brooke's mom, who tells the police, who then questions Brooke, and everything gets like mashed up in this game of telephone where it the story ends up being, it was my Uncle Clarence that did this. Brooke never said that. She did, however, speak to so many adults in between the time that this happened to the trial that she did get on the stand and testify that it was her Uncle Clarence that did it. I think personally kids are just impressionable and they want to please whatever adult is talking to them. And I think the Brazelton police and even her mom at the time um, really w wanted it to be solved and wanted it to be true that it was Uncle Clarence. And Brooke could either sense this, even if they didn't say it straight out, kids are smart. She could sense that that's the answer that they wanted to hear. So she said it. And I know you have kids. Do you think that's probably true? Really two things there. Mm -hmm. One, going back to that audio you played. Yeah. If I've ever in my life encountered something that justified everything I ever did in there, that was it. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Jesus. Um, additionally, past that, when you're dealing with investigators who don't want to investigate, they don't ask open-ended questions. Yeah. They ask leading mm -hmm. questions. So it's not a matter of who do you think did this? It's why do you think your uncle did this? Yeah. Well, the other thing that I noticed the, about- The, the question bleed to the answer oh, yeah. they want it to be. And and a six-year-old will pick up on that, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But the other thing I noticed about the audio is that if um, it was Uncle Clarence, why was Uncle Clarence not mentioned at all on that voicemail? If it was Uncle Clarence, don't you think that that would be one of the first things that she says? Yeah, to is somebody, anybody. Yeah, Uncle yeah. Clarence. Yeah, Uncle Clarence did this. Um, yeah. Uncle Clarence attacked my grandmother or killed my grandmother, something like that. Yeah. Okay, so Clarence. Well, had, when you know who it is, you don't say looks like. 
Exactly. Well, that's and, the thing. When I, you know, this, if you know the person who got you, mm -hmm. you don't say, hey, you know, my assailant looks like the person who got me. Yeah. I, I also it's, think that Tanya twisted that around and we'll, uh, you'll hear why in a, in a little bit. But the neighbor that she ran to, I think, was trying to get the heat off of somebody else. So I think she may have have messed up that game of telephone on purpose there's no evidence to that that's just my opinion that's allegedly you know <laughs> so i think if i say allegedly nobody can sue me right that's how that works <laughs> i don't know nothing about civil things <laughs> um so clarence had an almost airtight alibi for that night he was out at a bar with some friends got home around 2 30 in the morning and Clarence's son happened to be sick that night. So once Clarence arrived home at 2.30, his wife, Melinda, woke up and never went back to bed that whole night because the son was sick and she was awake with the son. So she says there's no way he could have left the house. I would, you know, I was up with the kid from 2.30 in the morning till till the next morning till till they found out what happened. So he's been in bed asleep the whole time. She knows for sure he didn't do it. The police don't believe her because they think, oh, this is his wife. She'll say anything to, you know, mm -hmm. which I don't know if I would or not. But, you know, he's got the people at the bar have an alibi for him at least until 2.30. And mm -hmm. they know that he did go home. Also, there's no other evidence. There's no blood in his car. Like, if there's this bloody scene and, they're, like, how do you then go drive to wherever and not get any blood anywhere. Also, there's no sign that anybody cleaned up themselves at the grandmother's house. So it's not like, oh, well, mm -hmm. somebody showered at the house. Um, also, it was about an hour away from his house. They said it could have been done in about 45 minutes in the middle of the night if he was speeding. Um, but yeah. even so, the attack took about two hours and it was an hour each direction. Okay. Yeah, and yeah. that's the thing. That's a heck of a motive. To be like it's two a.m. I think I'm going to haul ass and run red lights through town. Yeah, to go to, do this crazy thing that to kill it's my like, mother-in-law. Yeah, that that's just not how real life happened. No, and also they, they like the um, Melinda, his the his wife said that they didn't like the mother-in-law and her husband Clarence got along fine. It wasn't like they like had were like had any sort of ill will towards each other or anything so it doesn't even make sense that he would go there to to kill the mother-in-law yeah. and there would have been no way he would have known brooke was there you know it wasn't like we had social media back then where it's posted that oh brooke's spending the night at grandma's house you know there he wouldn't have known that yeah and that's a heck of a way to deal with a witness is i just committed a murder so i'm gonna let the person who can finger me live exactly exactly that it's not the, um, that nothing about that makes sense end to end. Not at all. Especially when the person knows you personally could say him. Exactly. Yep. So that you don't have to be smart to know not to do that. Yeah. Well, and one of the things that he was convicted of was attempted murder. So they thought he tried to kill the six year old and she was just so resilient, which she don't get me wrong. She was very resilient and she did survive, but one of the things they said during the trial is that he tried to kill a witness, you know. Okay, so Clarence gets arrested and really the only evidence at his trial is this testimony this uh, from the six-year-olds. Um, Melinda knows he didn't do it and she he gets uh, convicted. He's found uh, guilty of murder, attempted murder, and the rape of Brooke. Um, Melinda knows he didn't do it. She makes it her life's mission to prove his innocence, which it's crazy that she would have to prove somebody's innocence. It shouldn't have to work like that. But the police were done with it. They're like, yep, we're done. Got the guy. Done with that case. And it's not looking into it anymore. So she's like, well, I'm going to have to look into it. This woman, man, she did a lot more than I think I even would have thought to do. But she pulled up the sex offenders list of all the sex offenders in the area, got all dialed up, went out to the places that these guys hung out, the different bars in the town, kind of like sidled up to them and would collect empty beer bottles or cigarette butts for all of these different sex offenders. DNA was in its infancy at this time. So 
The Brazelton Police Department didn't even have the capacity to be testing DNA, but she knew um, probably, I mean, I know I learned about DNA from the O.J. Simpson trial, so I assume most people in the United States learned even the words DNA put together in a sentence from that trial. So she knew it was something that could be done. It just wasn't being done like today. Every case gets DNA tested, I would think, if there's DNA to test anyway, you know. Well, I'm not going to give the, the police that way out. I was, my case is also from 98. Yeah. And they took six vials of blood for DNA. So this wasn't this wasn't some Star Trek science fiction stuff they were really? toying with at the time. They were already collecting it from everybody. The and did, but were they testing in, it in the state of Ohio in a uh, any kind of uh, murder case, no matter what the degree or what the matter, they automatically take your DNA and enter it into the database. Okay. They were doing that when they took me in, which is the same year they took him in. Yeah. So they don't get they, they don't get that free pass of they were you know that's just not something they were doing at the time. They did it with me, and it was the yeah. same year. Okay. Well, you're. I mean, I was just thinking it's a small town, and I know big cities were doing it before small towns mm -hmm. were. But also, there's like the Ohio Bureau of Investigations. I assume there's something like that. I'm not sure if that's what it's called. Mm -hmm. Like in Georgia, we have the, the GBI and, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But you would think that if they needed help with a case, they would have called them in. Some mm -hmm. small town police departments don't want to get any, but the fed, the feds or the state governments involved because they want to solve it themselves. It's our case, we'll solve it. And it's mm -hmm. more of a like bravado thing, you know. And that could have been the case here too. Oh, there's all kinds of things that possibly could be. And yeah. None of them are good. Yeah. Well, it's bad police work for sure. Because uh, we know that this ends up that he he's not the one that did it. So, uh, so she ends up going around collecting beer bottles, cigarette butts, straws from people's drinks, and keeping them all labeled in Ziploc bags in her freezer for years. She does this. Uh, and about she had lost touch with her sister Brooke's mom she didn't really talk to her after the murder because obviously Brooke's mom thinks that hey your husband killed our mom and raped my daughter and you're defending him so they kind of lost touch but about three years later they got back in touch and kind of rekindled their relationship they both had their they I think they agreed to disagree in a way but they wanted Brooke to have a relationship with her cousins because Melinda and Clarence had two boys and, you know, family's important. So um, Brooke's mom was allowing her to go over and spend time with Melinda and her cousins. And this is where um, Brooke's 10 years old now and she sees a picture of Uncle Clarence on the wall and sees that Uncle Clarence has blue eyes and says to her aunt melinda and her mom hey it couldn't have been uncle clarence because the guy that did this has brown eyes and i saw the picture of uncle clarence and he has blue eyes so it wasn't him so now mom's on board that it wasn't him everybody's on board that it wasn't him so they finally get the police to do dna tests of there was um bodily fluids male blood bodily fluids found in Brooks' underwear as well as the grandma's underwear, um, and they test it, and it does not come back to a match. It c does not come back to match Clarence's. You would think right there that would be enough <laughs> to get him. Um, One of the things uh, after my end of things took place, mm -hmm. and we found out what uh, you know what the act what actually happened and everything. Mm -hmm. One of the big conversation points was how dirty it was, how hard the state was fighting him. Insane, right? It's yeah. well, this was like, this is later after he, the court actually ruled. Mm -hmm. And even then he had to fight for his release. The state actually uh, filed against the court trying to prevent him from being released. Yeah. And I think it all just kind of came down to they didn't want to pay that settlement. Um, you know, they didn't want people's names were attached to this and they didn't want the embarrassment. But they fought hard even after he proved his innocence. They fought hard to keep yeah. him in there. 
Yeah, exactly. Well, so the DNA doesn't match and he goes in front of, you know, he gets an appeal and he goes in front of the judge and the judge says, no, you can't get out of prison, even though the DNA, like, first of all, why would there be a male DNA in the kid's underwear and the grandma's underwear that's the same? There's no, that has to be the killer's DNA. There's no other explanation for why, why it would be there, yeah. you know? Um and the judge says it's because he was not convicted with DNA evidence. So you can't get let out with DNA evidence. It's not like it was evidence that was um, going against the evidence that um, convicted you. But keep in mind, by this time, the kid had changed her her story as well, saying going back to her original story is that the guy looked like my uncle Clarence. And as a six-year-old, you don't have a lot of ways to just describe things. Like if you're going to describe somebody, mm -hmm. it, not like an adult would be like, well, he had brown hair and brown eyes and he was, mm -hmm. you know, medium build. She, he's, she's going to think of somebody in her life that's sort of the same size and shape of this guy and mm -hmm. say, he looked like this guy. That's what a kid's going to do, a six-year-old, you know? Yep. Um, Either way, whatever judge that was, I wish I would have made a note of the judge that did that in my notes, but I didn't because I'd like to call. I remember it was a Judge Judy something. I remember it was Judge Judy. It wasn't that Judge Judy, but I remember it was a Judge Judy something um, that did that to him. Insane. So now it is 2001. So he's been in jail for several years now. And yeah. yeah. And Melinda's going or, or sorry it's 2005 that dna thing happened in 2001 so a few more years go by and melinda sees a newspaper article she's sitting at her kitchen table in the morning drinking some coffee and she sees a newspaper article about a couple who was sexually abusing their daughters in the newspaper, it lists Tanya Brazel. Yes, that that Tanya Brazel who left Brooke standing out on her front porch for 45 minutes the day after the murder and her husband, a common law husband, Earl Mann. And they're uh, apparently accused of, uh, not convicted yet, of abusing Tanya's daughters. They were Earl's stepdaughters. And Melinda starts putting two and two together and it's like, where was Earl Mann on the night my mom and my, you know, got murdered? He had been out of jail for about five days um, before this happened and ended up going back to jail several months after that. So he was in, uh, he was next door basically when this happened. And she's like, I, this is going to be the guy. He was so close. He obviously has a thing for little girls, you know, he's abusing his own stepdaughters and uh, decides we need to get this guy's DNA. Lucky. <laughs> this is just it's like I can't believe that all of this stuff lined up like this, but he happened to be in the same prison as you and Clarence and and mm -hmm. in the same. What do you call it? Like a pod or what is like block block? Yeah. In the same block. Um uh, so I guess you can tell me, I guess, a little bit about what it was like when uh, I was, I was Earl already in there with you. And then Clarence came, do you remember, or you just know that they were both. Yeah, in there? I, honestly, that long, it's, I don't remember who came first. I want to say, uh, man was there first. Yeah. Cause he was, I mean, he come in and play like the poker games and stuff like that. Yeah. But it's, I, it's one of those things It may not be in the records and I know it's you and I were talking about this before the show. Yeah. Uh, I, I just distinctly remember the conversation of, uh, Clarence coming from another joint because the conversation was this guy is really screwed now landing in our house. Like he should have stayed put. Yeah. And that uh, very may well, I, I just didn't see it in any of the research that I did. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, if that may, he may have decided, look, I got to get to this prison where this Earl guy is <laughs> to get his yeah. DNA. Yeah. Well, the thing is, and it's like, I don't know if I want, I don't know if I should start with, you know, the knowledge I got now or how it was when we didn't know. But it's up to you. I'm, it's your story. It, we would talk about, I remember actually talking about this guy 
with mm -hmm. some of the fellas when he arrived because we we really had a reputation as far as when it came to um pedophiles child molesters things like that i mean that was what we did with them was part of the culture i mean that was that was a source of income there yeah. was the guards were very much don't kill them so we have to do paperwork everything else was fair game so you could do and anything you want short of killing the man i yeah uh, nice. there there yeah there's stuff i won't say on your show <laughs> thank you and it was just <laughs> commonplace you know, because one of your bragging points was how far can you push this guy where he'll still do what he's told and pay? Mm -hmm. You know, how how much can this guy take? You know, I mean, they would reach the point where a lot of these pedophiles would commit suicide and the fellows would take bets on it. Oh. How's he going to do it? Oh, he's close. I can see it in his eyes. How's, how's this one going to do it? You know, we'd actually have a Deadpool. Yeah. You know, guessing on how this guy's going to uh, check himself out. But I remember the conversation when this guy arrived in the block, because naturally we get to talking about him like, oh, there's one. Yeah. Was the joke was he, that he came from Madison, which was like the sex offender joint. That's where they have all the programs and, you know, okay. all the things specifically tooled for them. And that's a medium security prison, you know, and it's a retirement joint. Like it's, you know, it's the kind of prison we make other prisons make fun of. Mm -hmm. And we remember, I remember uh, the conversation being just how bad this guy had screwed up. Yeah. Like you was all right. Now your property. It's interesting that they have a separate prison for sex offenders to sort of like the state is trying to keep them safe. Yeah. You want to really pull your hair out. It's the same prison. They put the bound over juveniles until they turn 18. <gasps> <laughs> yeah. Not wrap your head together, around that. Though, not mixed together though. Right. Like a separate. Not block? mixed together. Okay. No, they're separate. They're, they're, they're separated from each other, but oh my goodness. needless to say, we all find that pretty gross. Yeah, I find that You know, because you get gross. bounced over to serve your time as an adult, you're still 16, 17 years old. You go to Madison until you turn of age, and then they send you to a different joint. Yeah. But it's like, you're in the same, you're in the same joint as the pedos. Yeah. You know, with their programs. Like, we, we all found that pretty disgusting. It's but, so Clarence was not treated well, as from what I understand from you. The crazy thing is, the only way he could have gotten to us was mm -hmm. to have gotten in so much trouble. Yeah. That Madison decided, okay, we're going to give you what you're looking for. It's almost that's how as God... if he wanted to be in the same block as <laughs> Earl Man. <laughs> One thing everybody in Ohio knows mm -hmm. is if you screw up enough, you cause enough problems, you eventually land in Mansfield. Yeah. You, and like they just I was put telling you, you earlier. To start with, right? What's that? They just put you there to start with, right? No, I got I, I got kicked out of two other joints before I landed there. Oh, this is new information you know? to me. Interesting. You're bad. <laughs> yeah. I, I was. That's a whole other thing. No, but. <laughs> well, I have to have another show about that. <laughs> yeah. No, I went through three prisons in less than a year. Okay. Um, but once again, you 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 cause enough problems. Mansfield's basically the it's you're the gonna we're gonna give you we're gonna give you what you want. Okay. Like the state has, what I was telling you before the show, the state has one maximum security prison, and that's Lucasville, mm -hmm. which everybody heard about the Lucasville riots. It's mm -hmm. you know if you get in enough trouble at Lucasville and cause them enough headache, they'll lower your security to send you to us. Gotcha. Okay. That's how they, that's the way Mansfield was like, okay, you want it? Here you go. Wow. So for him to be there mm -hmm. would have taken a profound amount of effort. Yeah. And he had like, to convince them just that, okay. Judging from the interviews and things that I've seen with him, he seems like a very chill, like calm mm -hmm. guy. He's, he's not a criminal. Yeah. So he had to no. put, he had to, like switch something in his brain to do that yeah dude he was a very meek guy mm -hmm. um which didn't help him either because then he gets there and then he gets into trouble a couple times but he eventually lands in our block yeah which and, apparently is exactly where he wanted to be and and yeah. the reason why is because melinda has figured out that earl man is the killer but mm -hmm. she has to prove it now so, yeah, and that's the thing is he's in he's in the block with us. Yeah. Now this Earl man, he, he I mean he ain't one of the fellas, mm -hmm. 
but he ain't a problem either. He's just, okay. he's a, when he came to us, he's just a thief. Yeah. You know, we, that, that was what his rap sheet said, that, you know, in his folder when he popped off the bus. Mm -hmm. All right. Just you keep an eye on this guy out the corner of your eye. Make sure he don't touch nothing. Yeah. Other than that, you don't pay him much attention. You yeah. know, you kind of let him rise and fall on his own merit. Um, like I said, he was a frequent flyer in uh, the Viper Pit, our poker room. Okay. Um, he was in there a lot. And, uh, he, yeah, he had a problem with getting himself in debt because he wasn't good at it, which is one of the reasons why we let him in. Okay. But it's – and I think the reason I bring up the, the Viper Pit poker room mm -hmm. is that's really where I remember Clarence from. He was stalking uh, Earl, it sounds yeah. like. Yeah, because he would stick his head in there and he'd be like, hey, guys, can I bum a cigarette? Or we catch him trying to go through butts mm -hmm. and things like that. And you don't you don't so much as make eye contact when you're in that you're you're in that dude's class. Yeah. You know, a, a guy who you could be completely a guy who has nothing to do with you. He catches you standing up in a toilet. He's going to stop what he's doing to beat you. So he was going These through. Guys live a certain way. It seems like he was doing that on purpose. So it wouldn't look weird when he actually was able to collect. Earl now, Man's I think, DNA. No, I think what it was is he just kept trying to collect it. Oh, the problem was is you're running into a lot of people who we really want to hurt you. And any mm -hmm. opportunity you're going to give us is going to be good enough. Yeah. So that's the reason it didn't happen quickly. Because, mm -hmm. like I said, there's, I remember specifically, he, that door cracked open. He come in there and everybody just stopped and looked at him. He's like, hey, can I get one of those cigarette butts? A man stopped what he's doing, walked over there and drug him across the lot, across the block, beating him. Ooh. Okay. For having the nerve to speak to, to anybody yeah. in that room. Wow. I mean, just openly dragging him across the block and beating him while he's dragging him. Now, at that time, yep. could you smoke anywhere in the prison, or was there just certain areas that you could? You, you weren't supposed to smoke inside, but we didn't care. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> it didn't matter. It didn't matter where we were. Well, what ended up happening is that Earl Mann ended up putting out a cigarette in a, a fresh ashtray, a clean ashtray. There was no other cigarette butts in it, mm -hmm. and um, Clarence picked up the cigarette butt with a tissue or toilet paper or something like that, mm -hmm. folded it in there and kept it in his Bible until he was able to get it to his wife. And yeah. honestly, getting that out of there would have been no joke because the males watched in and out. Well, I think he ended up get, getting it to her at visit visitation, maybe. Yeah, that's what I mean. I mean, he yeah. would have had to have gotten that to her. That would have been just as hard getting that to her to visit as it would have been trying to smuggle drugs into a visit. Because you get uh, stripped he, on the way in, too. He did it somehow. He did he got, it. He, he but I'm did saying it that wasn't easy it. for him to do. Yeah. Well, I mean, he was determined. He knew he was innocent, mm -hmm. you know? And yeah. the only way for him to get out of prison and watch his kids grow up is to get this mm -hmm. done. And it sounds like he yep. went through a lot of abuse to make this happen. It, a long time of it. Yeah. And, I mean, the thing is, in hindsight, I mean, obviously, no one would know. It's like, you know... I'm sorry he went through that, mm -hmm. but at the same time, in defense of the men that are in there, mm -hmm. they all say they're innocent. Yeah. Everybody's you know, innocent. It's like Shawshank Redemption. Yep. And I mean, they eventually, under different circumstances, ended up admitting it, but mm -hmm. it's, but no, that's the thing. Him saying I didn't do it meant nothing to nobody. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I don't be the same way. Yeah. yeah. I would think if you somebody's know, in there for raping their six-year-old niece that mm -hmm. somebody somewhere uh, looked at some evidence and thought that that's what happened, you know? Yeah. Like, I would just assume that they're correct. Yeah, uh, that's the thing is, like, all we looked at is that rap sheet, mm -hmm. you know, that file when you got off the bus. Yeah. And because, like I said, if you believe these guys, they're as mythical as the Sasquatch. Yeah. You know, oh, well, since none of you did it, no, obviously this is something that never really happened. You were all framed. Mm -hmm. And... You know, just like anybody else, just to get through his day, you know, he had to pay to somebody. Yeah. He, you know, he went through the same because you're subhuman, you're property. Yeah. And anything goes. And so he went through the same stuff that all these other creatures went through, you know. And like I said, knowing what I know, 
I wish it, I wish he hadn't have gone through that, but I don't regret all the rest of them going through it. Well, and it's especially thing, given you were dealing with the the information that you had at the time, yeah. you know. Um, so it's hard to it's it's easy to look back and have hindsight. Mm -hmm. Obviously, hindsight is twenty twenty, and you know mm -hmm. that it was you know he was the wrong guy now, but that's not the information you had at the time. So no, and that's not something we were investigating. Exactly. Yeah. That's the thing. Once. You know, once you got that label, that's that's your existence. Yeah. There's there's there, there's no good way out. Yeah, exactly. And even if he, it, even if it came to light that it wasn't, if they hadn't let him out when they did, if he would have had to go back to that cell block, even yeah. even with the DNA that, by the way, ended up being matching Earl. Like, okay, mm -hmm. so real quick, what happens is. The state says, we're not testing DNA. This is a closed case. So Melinda starts a website um, and collects money. It's kind of like GoFundMe would be now, but it was like her own website she, she has made with all the information on the case and is collecting donations and raises $40,000 to get this DNA tested. And thank goodness that she figured out, because she, remember, she's got this freezer full of other pedophiles' DNA, um, but she figured out which one she needed to test and gets the cigarette butt from Clarence, gets it to her lawyer, has this money waiting for it because, you know, she's it's been years now that she's been fighting for his freedom. Um, they test it. It comes back to be a, a match. The So the DNA that was in the grandmother's and the niece's underwear at the crime scene matches Earl Mann's. And uh, I think it was a couple of weeks later, they were able to get it in front of a judge. And immediately that day, the judge looked at it and released him. So thank goodness that that judge was not like the Judge Judy from before. And it's like, well, I don't know. We'll have to do another hearing or something, you know. Uh, she released him from, from the courtroom that day. Yeah, because it, it was wild because it's one of those things where he leaves and then they come snatch up man at the same time. And ever everybody in there, our thought on it was that, you know, man had done something to him and this dude had somehow gotten word to a guard who actually cared yeah. or gotten word outside. Because usually these guys telling the guards don't save you. And honestly, they can't even use the telephone without one of us getting on them. Okay. Like getting word out. Yeah. These yeah, pedophiles, getting word out is no small task. Yeah. There's someone on you at all times. So we thought maybe dude, dude had done something to him and he'd managed to got word out and got him so hemmed up by the highway patrol. You didn't know why they came and got man. No, not right away. Nope. We and thought. Did you notice? Yeah, we so thought that, it was he done but, something to Clarence and Clarence had somehow snitched. Gotcha. Like gotten word past everybody. And we're like, ah, he, you know, and old boy got nodded up. And did you just figure Clarence, when he didn't come back, he went to court that day. Um, I assume there's a bus or something that takes people to court. And he never um, came back on the bus. So did you yeah, think he just got transferred? Well, it wasn't long after that. It, I mean, it was almost right afterwards it popped up on the news. Oh, okay. So it was, yeah, it was almost immediately afterwards that popped up on like 10 TV. And so we're all, we're all kind of looking at each other in astonishment. Yeah, I bet. You know, uh, that's how word got around to us. Was, was like it popping Andy up du on the news? He was like Andy Dufresne. He was the only one in there that actually was innocent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's the thing is, you know, you don't you spend enough years in there, you don't actually buy. As a general rule, you don't buy into the whole innocence thing. Yeah, because everybody's innocent in court, and then the moment you get them in a group of fellas, they start bragging about what they did and how they did it. Yeah. Yeah, or so even it, yeah. If, it, it seems even if the crime that they're convicted for right then, even if they didn't do that one, they were pieces of crap before and, and committed crimes that they didn't get caught for. So they still kind of deserve to be in prison. Yeah. yeah. And plus, nobody wanted to be that. Nobody wanted to be that guy in there. It's like, I don't belong here. Yeah. You know, nobody wanted to be that cat. You know, it's yeah. just it is what it is. You go to sleep at night. Yeah. 
Uh, well, it ends up having a happy ending because, I mean, I don't know if this is a, a happy ending, but it, it is for yeah. for Clarence, but um, I'm just going to put this on the screen. Um, he ends up suing the uh, state of Ohio as well as the, Bar the city of Barberton police uh, because they committed Brady violations. Turns out... Um, I'm going to read a little bit of this is this is the lawsuit that uh, he brought against the state. It says the plaintiffs say uh, the defendant's officers committed a Brady violation by failing to disclose an incriminating statement that Earl Mann made before Clarence Elkins trial on January 5th, 1999, four months before Clarence Clarence Elkins trial began. Barberton police officer Gerald Anarnucci we're just going to go with that pronunciation. Yeah. Uh, arrested Good Earl idea. Mann. Yeah. Arrested Earl Mann for robbery. During the course of the arrest for robbery, Mann, drunk and somewhat somewhat belligerent, asked Officer Anarnucci, "Why don't you charge me with Judy Johnson's murder?" Uh, because he had been trained, if you do something or hear something or know something that the detective bureau should know about, you put it in a memo. So long story short, this officer made a memo and put it out to everybody who was involved in the Judy Johnson murder case and, and put it out to those departments. And they never disclosed this memo, which is exculpatory evidence. Um, and that basically means it's evidence against his guilt, not for his guilt. Never gave it to Charles or to Clarence Elkins attorneys at the time. So basically, um, Clarence ends up getting a million dollars from the state of Ohio and $5 million from the city of Barberton Police Department because they done messed up and basically put him in prison for six years, not only in prison for six years, but in prison for six years as a child sex offender, which is kind yeah, of the yeah. worst kind of prison there is. Yeah, the, the amount of time he did isn't what he earned that money for. No. Yeah. That, and honestly, the way things go down in there, that's that's a disrespectfully low amount. Yeah. That's he he doesn't ever get to undo mm -hmm. what happened. Exactly. You know, I mean that's the thing. It's every a lot of people don't seem to understand this because from what I understand, just talking to people like on Twitter and stuff, there's places that protect these things. Mm -hmm. They put them in protective custody or a separate part of the compound or something. That's foreign to me. Yeah. That's not how it was when we were. They were fed to us. It was every minute of every day. This man did this this man was never allowed to look up from his shoes without really? being afraid. That's how they lived. And it was just every single other person in there that was not a sex offender, I assume, that's treating him like this, right? He's just the Everybody. bottom of the barrel, lowest of the low. If you spotted one of them do something they shouldn't mm -hmm. and didn't, if you don't do something to him and somebody sees that, so you that's on you now. You could not show him any kindness at all. Oh, if I spotted somebody, I mean, that, that's the thing. It's one of those... I mean, it could be something as subtle as eye contact and he just kept on walking. I would stop what I'm doing and go walk up to the other guy and go, so that's just who you are, huh? Yeah. You, just, you know, you're going to go make him dinner? Oh, yeah. That That's how bad it was. Like, I mean, it's like, oh, so you're on his side, are you? It. I mean, it, you, you couldn't, even if you didn't care, you couldn't let it fly because yeah. the rest of us wouldn't let you. And so you so, couldn't, no. uh, you couldn't, do something like buy him a cup of coffee or, or, or give him a cup of coffee or something like that? It wasn't okay to ignore him. Gotcha. <laughs> uh, and the reason I bring up coffee is because if you're looking for really good coffee, <laughs> I'm trying to do a good transition here, but I make myself laugh, so it's very hard. <laughs> but, you know, he couldn't get a good cup of coffee, but you can at northarrowcoffee.co. Use code or use discount code Hawkhound for 10% off. 15% of all the money that North Arrow Coffee makes goes to pro-life charities. And I love that about them. The coffee is actually really good. Every single show you see me drinking out of my overruled mug, North Arrow Coffee, because it's so good. Um, I love it. You'll love it. Get some today. NorthArrowCoffee.co. Don't forget to use discount code Hawkhound for 10% off. 
back to the story. <laughs> Sorry to cut you off like that. <laughs> no, it's fine. Uh, no, what he, what you couldn't buy him in there was a shot of mutt. That's what the coffee was. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. So, but no, that's the thing. That was that's what I mean by what he got out of it. That's a disrespectfully low amount because it, it is every waking minute of their lives. It's yeah, something. Well, one of the things that I know, and I didn't put it in my notes, but you and I talked a little bit about it uh, before the show. But some he used that money to do. He he had post traumatic stress from being in prison, mm -hmm. and he used some of that money to get some sort of. Um, I guess, experimental surgery for people with PTSD uh, that that did something in their brain, some sort of brain surgery. And it was, um, I, I wish I would have looked more into it, but it was something where the doctor pokes around in his brain somehow and it relieves the uh, anxiety from the post-traumatic stress. And from what I could tell, it worked and it actually uh, is working for veterans who have post-traumatic stress as well. So that's a good thing about it. Well, and that's the one of the things, and I, I've thought about this is when you're when you're in the joint and you're supposed to be, there's a part mm -hmm. of your brain that accepts it. Yeah. Like you know, you 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 go to sleep at night. You mm -hmm. just you kind of accept, no matter how bad it is, you kind of you kind of accept you're supposed to be there. Yeah. So I imagine that even applies to these things, even when they're when you know things are exactly like what I was talking about. There's a part of their brain that kind of accepts it. Mm -hmm. But when you actually didn't do it, I can't and you're going imagine. through exactly what the guilty guys are going through. Mm -hmm. I can imagine where that would mess you up on a whole different level. Yeah. Um, Abby Libby is here and wants to say hi to you and might have some questions about the case. So I'm going to bring her in now. But right now I'm turning off YouTube because this is our special rumble only alternative platform only section of the show. We have about 10 more minutes left. So come on over to rumble uh, to see the rest of the show. And I'm going to bring Abby in and we are going to turn off YouTube. So bye YouTube. See you later. And please help me welcome Abby Libby of Conspiracy Pill to Fame. Hi, Abby. How are you? Hey, good. How are you guys? Good. So, Hello. what did you think? What did you think of this case? It's a crazy one, right? It's insane. I mean, only in Ohio, right? Yeah. You hope. You hope. Yeah. <laughs> we do exist. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. This seems this seems to be evidence uh, to the contrary. But if you say so. Um, so, did you have any questions about the case or for Justin? I do have one. Okay. Um, so to clarify before I ask, I am glad that pedophiles are treated the way that they are. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to suggest that they shouldn't be treated that way, but is it to some extent a way to deal with your own guilt that at least I'm not as bad as this guy? Well, that's a good question. I imagine if I were to kind of sit down and think about it, I could see where that would kind of make sense. We're like um, Justin's therapist but, right now. <laughs> however, that's not how anybody was approaching it. Yeah. It's, most of us were dads. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's the thing is, um, that's just, that, that's a line. That, you know, obviously we're, we all admit what we are to each other in there. You know, people come home and play faces and, you know, we play games out here. Mm -hmm. But when we're when we're around our own, everybody's real honest about it, mm -hmm. you know, because that's part of your identity. That's part of your, you know, your credibility. But no, with these things, it's just like I said, when she played that video in the or that audio in the beginning. Yeah, that gets, and, that gets me every time I hear it. Yeah, that's there's a reason there's a special category for that. Mm -hmm. It's just not the same. And rightly so. Rightly so. Absolutely. Yeah. Abby had a little preview of that earlier this morning, that audio. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I saw you crying when you were listening. Someone was cutting onions. How dare you? <laughs> How dare you? Well, I guess one of the parts of the happy ending, though, is um, Earl got sent back under oh, those yeah. new charges. That's what I wanted to ask you about. So how do you think Earl's doing in prison nowadays? <laughs> I don't have to think. Yeah. I I, I know the people doing it to it. Okay. And it um let's 
he he's earned a special spot because it's one thing these creatures are all on the same level mm. he got sent back to the field not only as one of them but you tricked us mm. and that that earned him a special spot of honor yeah and, I uh, he's even lower than the lowest of the low at that point it's it, it the, the treatment became special nice to the point where it's actually inter-institutional now um last i heard last time i spoke to somebody um he's actually in lucasville now they actually raised his security and uh it's really no better for him there i bet not because but yeah the moment he gets off the bus and he we, when you've been down long enough you know somebody in every joint just because of guys transferring mm -hmm. so as soon as you arrive somebody else somewhere else everybody's sending word to the guys they know there Hey, here's the score, Ooh. and they pick up they pick up from pick up things, and that is going to be the rest of his life until he taps out. Well, and I imagine when it happened, it was a pretty big news story. You said you saw it in on the TVs in the in the prison, so I imagine other prisoners saw that as well. Yeah, like no, we yeah it would be it was on in the TV, you know, because we have a TV room we can go into. Yeah, and uh, it's popping up on the TVs, and yeah, that that made that word made it around like fire. I bet. And, uh, and like I said, it's just the state knows what it's doing. So mm -hmm. when they sent him back to the same joint, the state knew what they were doing when they did mm -hmm. that. Yeah. That wasn't a coincidence. <laughs> that was done purposefully. Good. Yeah. So one, one more question I have for both Abby and Justin. What do you think of Tanya? And do you think that she should also be in prison? Because... <laughs> It sounds like she, first of all, she left Brooke out on the porch for 45 minutes. Do you think it's because uh, her boyfriend was cleaning up the blood or like, w was she covering for him? What was that about? And do you think that she was the part fact of that she the left him on the, the fact that she left him on the porch meant he was in the house. Yeah. Yeah. That's that 45 what 45 minutes was that 45 minutes was her getting hit, going to him going, what did you do? Yeah. And then him talking her into compliance. Mm -hmm. And then giving her, here's what we need to do. Mm. That's my theory based off of what you said at the beginning of the video. That's the first thing I was thinking when you were tell you telling that part of the story. Imagine a bloody and bruised six-year-old child shows up on your doorstep at 7 a.m. and you leave her stand on your front porch for 45 minutes. That's just, yeah. would you not cover her in a blanket and bring her inside and call the police? Like, I don't know who wouldn't do, what kind of monster wouldn't do that immediately. Well, to go to what I was saying about how hard we are on them in there, mm -hmm. about saying like, you're not even allowed to ignore them because it just, by just li leaving them be kind of made you harshly like being like mm -hmm. you're sympathetic to them. Gotcha. Apply that same logic to somebody who actually actively helped one of them. Yeah. So that's my opinion on what should happen to her. Yeah, I agree. I definitely agree. And she's not, I mean, one of the documentaries that I watched, she's actually interviewed on it. So she's out doing press and stuff. <laughs> yeah, it was yeah. insane. Insane. Um, anything to close out? I know you had a hard out for five o'clock, Justin. So I want to get mm -hmm. you out of here. Did you have anything to close out? No. Uh, I mean, any questions, anything I could fill in the blanks on? Yeah, it does. Does anybody in the chat have any questions? I'd like to thank uh, Abby, who's right here for, for the donation, as well as Real Truth Cactus. I appreciate I have a monthly supporter on uh, Rumble now. Uh, that's the first one. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, let me see if there's any questions. Justin, how, how common would you say it is that that a woman is behind uh, some of these crimes? I, obviously, I wasn't around the females doing it, but based off of these guys didn't have a lot of secrets after mm. we've had our hands on them for a while. I'm going to say that's actually pretty uncommon. Uncommon. Okay. I, I would say because one of the things they would do to save themselves is they would start, they always started off denying it. Mm -hmm. And then they would start off trying to blame other people. And then they'd eventually get to trying to bargain with you. And then finally they get down to being trying to be a victim themselves and then confessing. They always went through the same process. Yeah. And 
part of that process was they would just blame anybody they could possibly blame mm -hmm. other than themselves. And I can't imagine, I, I can't, I can't say I've overheard a lot of times where a woman was the one being thrown under a bus. Interesting. Okay. I, I would think a woman, even if she was helping after the fact, if she did end up going to prison, I mean, a, most women in prison are moms themselves. And if they know what she was covering up would probably not treat her very well as well. You know? Yeah. Well, I was thinking about your case last week, Katie, where it was, it was the grandmother covering it up. And there's one yeah. in my personal life where it was a woman covering for a teenage yeah. boy. So it happens know. a lot. It happens a lot. I can see lot. where there's a lot of examples where somebody just doesn't speak on it. Mm -hmm. I could see where there could be ton of the tons of those, but I I can't say I've run I've run into any kind of I've run into any personal experience where somebody's given me indication that a woman's helping cover it up frequently, okay. yeah, or was right. like a part of it. I just I, I I haven't ran into a lot of that, so I, I got to in my mind I'm going to say it's infrequent. Okay, that's that's nice to hear. Yeah, yeah. Now y'all are guilty of other stuff. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> we know. We know. <laughs> I can't believe Justin is calling me guilty like this. <laughs> yeah, because so, Katie. She's an innocent well, angel. Well, it's like you yeah, said a little I, bit ago. It's so I feel better about myself. Exactly. Um, but we all know that I've never done anything wrong in my life, and I'm an innocent ever. angel. So, ever, so, ever, ever. So, all right. Well, um, having said that, I, we're going to cut it off. I'm going to play the outro music. And um, if you want to stick around, we can talk after. If you got to go, that's cool, too. But yeah. I'd like to thank you all, uh, thank both of you for coming, but thank you especially, Justin. Make sure you follow Justin on Twitter at Justacon. It's still Justacon, but your name has changed, right? Yeah. Uh, Con Solo, mm -hmm. <laughs> at Justacon. On Twitter.com, he is a great follow. He also has a Substack, which I will link in the descriptions of all the platforms that we're on right now. Uh, it's He's got really good stories, and we're definitely going to have you back, I hope, maybe on a more routine basis. We'll see. We'll talk. You know, yeah. you know where to I'll have to think of, I'll have to come up with somebody else I used to know that's interesting. And I'll just <laughs> okay. ride their coattails onto your show. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I want to, I want you to come on and cover new cases, but we'll talk. We'll talk off air. We'll talk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Abby, yeah, you can I do that. I do have to go for now. I've got free. <laughs> I, I've got uh, things to carry. Okay. <laughs> hey, have, a have a wonderful night. day. We'll talk to you later. Yep. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. And simple plan, no scrubs for the grease in my pimples. Damn, from the soft streets of southeast Michigan, hit and shuffle till I settled on a different jam. And when a dime won't do a better nickel can, and let me tell you when I used to dig them Simpsons, man. A funny thing about time, you can't get it back. A tight grip, but it rips the jacket. Slight list with a mix of traffic. You see about me, like Mr. Glass. Always wished I was a whiz at graphics. Take me back to the past where the hits were massive. You can hear Gladys Knight and the pips on plastic. Misfit molasses. Delete my contacts just so I can stick to glasses. Feel that skipped out, so I miss the classics. Aristotle of the bottle. Seneca of the simple action. Senator of the simple maxim. I swear for a Skillful Saxon, I'm still relaxing. Who wanna take a dip in the mind sauce? Making up for the time loss. Forgetting all my past was when I sign off. Prime bribe, prime rib, Agent Smith, prime boss. Popping red pills to my minds off, minds off. First Florida man. First Florida man.